A very good morning and allow me to welcome you all to the fifth installment of what is an eight part seminar series. Today, our focus will be on the importance and impact of policies to industrialize Africa to bring about economic as well as social transformation. My name is Nico Koza, and I am with the African Union Development Agency. And uh, for those of you who are joining us for the first time, a very warm welcome. And as mentioned, this is the fifth edition of an eight part series where each session has been designed to focus on a specific development area. Ultimately, the outcomes of all of these discussions will serve as an input into a think tank inception conference on Africa's integrated development prospects. The conference will be held later this year in Ethiopia, Addis Ababa from the 4th to the 6th of October more precisely. Colleagues and ladies and gentlemen, the AUJ NEPAD Africa Policy Bridge Tank Program, together with the African Futures and Innovation Program at the Institute for Security Studies are jointly hosting the seminar. It will be presented, followed by an expert-led dialogue and discussion on industrialization as a critical pathway, offering the potential to drive economic development and improve the livelihoods of the people of Africa. I'm absolutely looking forward to our session this morning, and our presenter will be Mr. Kwasi Yebua, who is currently a senior researcher in the African Futures and Innovation Program. He recently served as lead author on ISA studies on the long-term development prospects of the DRC, the Horn of Africa, Nigeria, as well as Malawi. Kwasi has published on various issues relating to foreign direct investment in Africa, and he also holds a PhD in economics. This morning, we also have three respondents whom I will ask just to switch on their cameras and give us a virtual wave. We've got Fernanda Cantu, who is the Chief Statistician uh, of the United Nations Industrial Development Organization. Welcome, Fernanda, if you can give us a wave there. We also have Edward Brown, who is a Senior Director uh, for Research and Policy Engagements at the African Center for Economic Transformation. He's giving us a wave as well. Good morning and welcome oh, to you, sir. Oh. We are also joined by Blaise Bayou, who is a Tech and Public Policy Researcher as well. So give us a wave as well, Blaise, if you will. Um, gentlemen, looking forward to your insights as well as the discussion. And to all our participants online, let me encourage you to utilize the Q&A function. If you have any comments, insights, or questions, please feel free to post them and we will address them uh, once we've had our presentation and we've heard from our respondents as well. So without any further ado, uh, Kwasi, I'm going to hand over the virtual floor to you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Nico, for the introduction. And again, welcome to the workshop on this important issue for Africa uh, manufacturing. Uh, my presentation, we have two main uh, parts. The first part is to uh, briefly uh, present the current state of industrialization in Africa and also show you how uh, an industrialization push in Africa can affect the continent development prospect. My presentation will be done through our website. So you can see here. Our website, the African Future Innovation Program, our website, we contain a lot of information. Yeah, we, you, from this website, you can have an analysis, uh, analysis on the development prospect of all African countries. Yeah, you click on any country and you can see the, our analysis on the development prospect of their country to 2043, the end of the 13 year implementation of the African Union Agenda 2063, you can go to any uh, regional economic community or income groups. We have also a thematic report, as we can see demographic, agriculture, health, education, and manufacturing that we'll be talking today about today. And for those who are joining us for the first time, we have already had a workshop on demographic, agriculture, education, and health. And after this, we also have workshop on financial flow, large infrastructure, and governance. And we have so interesting blogs on our website that keep you informed about the uh, latest socioeconomic development in, in Africa. 
So today, my presentation, as I said, will be on, on the manufacturing. So why Africa need to industrialize? Africa has made progress in terms of social, uh, human and economic development, but not fast enough compared to other developing region. Africa needs industrialization to achieve sustained growth to reduce the current high level of poverty. Industrialization uh, or manufacturing is considered as one of the key engine of economic growth, and it is associated with uh, job creation and uh, modern development. Evidence has shown that rarely a country uh, has a country evolved from poor to rich without uh, sustain such a transformation from agrarian or resource-based economy to industrial-based economy. Manufacturing also can help African countries to improve their external current account balance, which is structurally in deficit by diversifying export and also reducing import, thereby increasing their resilience to external shocks. All despite this important or the benefit from uh, of uh, industrialization. Industrialization in Africa has never taken off. Africa's experience with industrialization has been very disappointing. As we can see, if you look at this, uh, chart this chart for them showed a trend in african in manufacturing share in gdp africa versus east asia the period 1960 2020 the, the the orange line is for east asia and the blue line is for africa and the vertical as is the share of uh, manufacturing as presented in, in gdp as we can see we can see that in the, in the immediate period in the immediate post independence period manufacturing grew in Africa. And as you can see, the share of uh, manufacturing in Africa GDP was above that of East Asia. But that was short-lived. As you can see from the 1970s, manufacturing uh, took off in East Asia and Africa has never been able to catch up, ca catch up with East Asia, as you can see the, the two lines. Over time, manufacturing share in African GDP has either been stagnant or declining as you can see. And currently, manufacturing account for about 13% of African GDP, while it was about 17% in the 1970s. And uh, the share of Africa in manuf global manufacturing production has also declined from 3% in the 1970s to currently less than 2%. And manufacturing production in Africa has been uh, heavily in low technology, such as food, textile, footwear, uh, tobacco, among others. Only few countries have developed some capabilities in producing durable or capital goods, countries such as South Africa. But why Africa manufacturing has ne not been able to, to take off? Many factors can be uh, explained that. For example, in the 1980s, the debt crisis and the subsequent social adjustment program push many states in Africa to lose interest in industrial policies. Also, the absence of clear industrial development planning, weak infrastructure in Africa, uh, poor uh, uh, policy making, and also low, uh, uh, slow uh, trade integration in Africa, among other factors, has constrained manu manufacturing development in Africa. And the, the, the decline in manufacturing share in Africa's GDP has given way to a notion that Africa is experiencing a premature de-industrialization de because the country, the, the continent is de-industrializing at a very low level of income. So if we, we look at the trend in manufacturing share in GDP, in Sub-Saharan Africa, North African, and other uh, uh, region. As we can see here, the green line is for Sub-Saharan Africa. The yellow one is for North Africa. And South America is the blue one. As you can see, deindustrialization is evident in Sub-Saharan Africa, North Africa, and also in South uh, America. 
But as if you look at the, the green line, you see that manufacturing recently has been in sub-Saharan Africa. It has the lowest manufacturing compared to other developing region. By African standard, North Africa is the most in the industrialized region in Africa with manufacturing accounting for about 18% of GDP, what is less than 12% in sub-Saharan Af Africa. While deindustrialization is expected in high income economies because of the classic pattern of structural transformation, country moving from uh, agriculture to manufacturing and at the later stage of development to service sector. Deindustrialization in low income countries is alarming because this country will miss out the opportunity to grow rich by bringing the, the, the workers, their workers from farming to a well-paid factory jobs. For example, if we, we, we look at also at the composition of African economies, here we use six uh, sectors like agriculture, energy, ICT, materials, service, and manufacturing. And the dark blue is the share of service in Af African countries GDP. And the yellow one is agriculture and the orange is the share of manufacturing. Countries are ranked according to the share of manufacturing in GDP. As we can see, most of African countries economies are dominated by the service sector and the agriculture. Manufacturing in African economies, for example, range the share of manufacturing in African economy GDP range from about 25% for Eswatini and Algeria to only 2% in Sierra Leone. And for many African countries, as I said earlier, the share of manufacturing in GDP has been declining. And also uh, another characteristic of industrialization of the manufacturing sector in Africa is that the job, jobs are not being created at peace that much the expanding of the labor force in Africa. If you look at this chart, that shows manufacturing share in percentage in total employment in African countries. Here we have selected countries, countries where data is available. And this is the latest data available that we have. When we look at this chart, we can see that manufacturing uh, share in total employment in Africa is very low. It's, for example, range from about 16% in Mauritius to only 2% in Mozambique. In Mozambique, manufacturing sector account for only 2% of total employment, which is very low. And for some, uh, in some African countries, such as South Africa and others, the share of manufacturing uh, sector in total employment has even de been uh, declining. And some studies have shown that the poor performance of African manufacturing sector in a uh, job creation is that the large firms, most of the large firm, uh, manufacturing firms in Africa use a uh, capital intensive mode of production. By why the uh, firms are using a capital intensive mode of production, why labor is abundant in Africa? The uh, explanation is that those firms are competing with well-established uh, producers on the global market that are investing in labor saving uh, technology. So this is one of the reasons that these firms are, are using also a capital intensive mode of production to, to, to keep up in, in competition, to also uh, increase uh, their competitiveness. This is one of the reasons. But if this trend continue like this poor uh, performance in employment, it means that it will be difficult, difficult for Africa to use industrialization uh, uh, to absorb its growing uh, uh, labor force. But this is only the direct employment created by the manufacturing sector. And we all know the strong linkage between manufacturing sector and other sectors, by uh, service and, and agriculture, which means that manufacturing growth in Africa can boost indirect employment in other sectors. For example, if the agro industry, for example, ag uh, agro processing is a uh, capital intensive, but it also increase a job creation in the smallholder farming, which is labor intensive. So manufacturing can still help Africa to uh, create more jobs and reduce poverty on the, on, the, on, the African, on the continent. So from our side, we ask a question because Africa, the, the, the hope in industrialization uh, in Africa is very high. Many factors now show that 
Africa, there's hope, there's room for improvement in manufacturing in Africa. So for our, our side, we ask the question, what could be the impact of manufacturing push uh, on Africans' uh, uh, development prospect? So to answer this question, we developed a, a scenario or we conducted a policy simulation exercise to see uh, the impact. So to do that, we, we rely on a, a modeling and forecasting tool called the International Future Model developed by the Paddy Center for International Future uh, at the University of Denver. It's a, a model that is widely used in academic literature and it also uh, for policy analysis in Africa. And here we can see this is, this shall show the conceptualization of our scenario. So what we did uh, based on the, what the model can do and know what it cannot do, as we know all the models have their strengths and limitations. So here what we did, we improved government, uh, the regulation of business uh, by improving business environment in, in African countries, which is one of the, the key factors constraining manufacturing growth on the continent. We increase investment in the manufacturing sector, also increase uh, private and uh, public uh, investment in research development, and increase uh, revenue, government revenue to increase government ability to support its uh, industrialization policy. Also, usually manufacturing growth at the early stage of manufacturing growth can be associated with income inequality, which is known in the literature as Kuznet uh, curve or Kuznet tension. So to mitigate this effect also, we associate industrialization policy with uh, social government social, by increasing government social spending. And to also, we improve labor force participation as a proxy for uh, manufacturing, uh, labor intensive manufacturing. And if all things do go together, we expect a larger and more productive economy, African economies. And so what can be the, the simulation, the forecasting horizon, as I said, is but for 2043, the end of the 10-year implementation of the Agenda 2063 of African Union. So the intervention here in the model has have not been done randomly. We use a benchmarking process. We use a progress made by other countries or other regions as benchmark to do the modeling. And here we can see the impact on, Afri on Africa's GDP. The materialization of the ma uh, manufacturing scenario, for example, could increase growth in Africa, increase the size of Africa's economy. Here we have Africa GDP, the current path, the current part, which is business as usual scenario, dark blue, and uh, the size of African economy in the manufacturing scenario. On the current path or in the business as usual, the size of African economy is expected to be about 8.5 trillion, 2017 US constant US dollar. But in the manufacturing scenario, it could increase to more than 9, tri 9 trillion US dollars. So a difference of more than 650 billion, which is huge. If this is converted into GDP per capita, by 2043, the GDP per capita in Africa will increase by about 400 US dollars, which is huge given the size of African population by in 2043, estimated about more than 2 billion. And the gain in GDP per capita also differ by countries, as we will see. Here, this graph show the difference in GDP per capita in the manufacturing scenario and, and, and the current path. So the positive, positive figure here shows that the country again, in terms of GDP per capita, if the manufacturing scenario is materialized. So we see that all African countries are gaining in, in manufacturing push. It means that if we push on manufacturing in Africa, all African countries can improve the living standard of their population if we use a GDP per capita of an indicator indication of a living standard of the population. Some countries gain more than others, depending on the domestic factors, the level of development, uh, the policy in place, and also the size of the population and the country GDP per capita vary from one country to another. The materialization of the manufacturing scenario also could significantly reduce poverty in Africa 
And by 2043, our forecast showed that uh, Africa could maybe uh, lift about 53 million people out of poverty compared to the business is, uh, as usual scenario. And again, the reduction in poverty also varies according to country's uh, situation. So if we look at We look at this chart, we show the percentage point reduction in poverty rate, $1.90, current path, different current path and scenario. We see that poverty decline in all African countries. And the Fazam Malawi has 8.1 percentage point a reduction in poverty rate compared to the business as usual scenario. All the country gain. And when we look at the left hand side of this graph, poverty uh, percentage point reduction in poverty is small because these countries, usually North African countries, have very, very low levels of poverty at $1.90. That's why here we don't see a significant reduction in terms of percentage point reduction. But if you look at the absolute number of people left out of poverty, you see that Nigeria, South Africa, no, Nigeria and DRC, all countries gain more in terms of poverty reduction. So uh, to summarize, I can say, if manufacturing Af Africa is able, able to push on manufacturing, it could significantly improve the development prospect, could significantly uh, improve the de development outcome on the continent. Or I can say manufacturing will be central uh, to Africa's ability to achieve the Agenda 2063. Uh, so what could be the policy uh, recommendation from this study? Again, we have talk about money uh, policies in the report, and I'm going to mention some of them for the sake of time. So we say Africa, what we suggest here that Africa uh, government should have constructive relationship with the uh, state and the private sector, which would encourage uh, uh, private investment. Robust, robust private sector is very important for innovation and technological development. And also there's a need to improve business uh, visuals environment in Africa, which will help to attract foreign direct investment. Foreign direct investment, especially manufacturing FDI, are very important to help Africa advance its manufacturing and also uh, sophisticate its export. Africa need to invest in, in infrastructure, especially electricity and transportation. Electricity cost, for example, is more than three times higher in, in Africa than in South Asia. And today, uh, electricity consumption per capita in Sub-Saharan Africa is uh, lower than it was uh, 30 years ago. Africa need to, country need to improve macroeconomic stability. For example, stable exchange rate, stable inflation, and other indicators to, ensure, to uh, boost uh, investors' confidence. There's also a need to uh, accelerate the implementation of the African continental free trade to help uh, firms overcome the constraint of the narrow domestic market and generate uh, economies of scale. Africa needs also to leverage its comparative advantage in agribusiness, solid mineral and metal. For example, Africa uh, possesses these critical uh, minerals which, which that are required for green transition. And the continent needs to leverage this to advance its manufacturing. And some countries are already do, uh, doing well taking measures Countries like Ghana, Zimbabwe, and, and Namibia have, have banned export of these critical minerals, saying that those who need it, that minerals need to come to Africa to, to, for local processing. We, those are very important steps that other countries need to follow. Africa also need to develop the skills. So there should be a close collaboration between the government, the private sector, and the edu educational institution to address the mismatch between the graduate skills and the need of the labor uh, market. And they need also to develop a continental financing platform that support industrialization. Africa need to enhance domestic uh, revenue mobilization, which is very important to support industrialization policy and invest in research development to advance in industrialization in Africa. All, most of these uh, policy recommendations are known by African policymakers. But the problem in Africa is the implementation. We spend a lot of money uh, by drafting a uh, development planning, but the devil lies in the implementation. So I will end my presentation by saying that good policy making start with the with implementation. Thank you for your attention.
Thank you very much, Kwasi, for a very well presented report and congratulations um, to yourself and the team as well, really, for putting such a comprehensive um, report together. And at the very beginning, you made the case, and I think all of us would agree, that Africa definitely needs to industrialize. And when we talk about industrialization in Africa, we can't talk about it in the absence of manufacturing, which was a very big focus as well um, of, of your presentation. So thank you so much for taking us through that and as well as what the positive impacts would be if we really are to make positive strides and in inroads uh, when it comes to manufacturing in terms of GDP, uh, impact on poverty and the like. And I'm also happy to just note to all our participants that if you are looking for a link to the report, I believe it has been shared in the chat function. So you will most you are most welcome um, to follow that link to get the full report. Uh, without wasting any further time, I'd like to now you know lead us into that session uh, of our seminar where we'll hear from our respondents and then we enter into a QA session. Our first respondent will be Fernando Cantu. He is the Chief Statistician of the United Nations Industrial Development Organization, UNIDO, where he is in charge of delivering the organization's international mandate on producing and disseminating global industrial statistics, including on SDG9 indicators. Prior to that, he worked as a statistician and economist at different UN agencies, as well as other international organizations and academia. Fernando holds a PhD in econ econometrics from the University of Geneva in Switzerland. Fernando, may I invite you to make your remarks? Thank you so much. Uh, uh, and thanks again for the invitation to discuss such an important topic. This is really at the heart of our work at uh, UNIDO. We are the UN agency uh, that focuses on industrial development. So of course, this is uh, really our, our bread and butter and our everyday work. Um, uh, thank you so much for the report. I read it with great interest and thank you Kwasi for the great presentation. I think you did a great job in, in highlighting uh, the main points uh, raised in, in, in the report. and importance of, of industrialization for uh, the continent. Um, for my comments, um, so I have, let's say, I, I would say they're more or less in five areas. Uh, so I would like to organize them uh, in that way. Uh, and to start with, I would also like to, uh, to begin by uh, highlighting how, how important it is for, for Africa to industrialize. Uh, industrialization, I mean, has been proven time and time again, it's really an, an engine of growth. Uh, and the experience from different countries have shown that it, it is one of the best strategies for uh, uh, achieving some uh, development, uh, increasing productivity, and, and uh, achieving a, a diversified and a stable economy. I think the report does a, a good job at showing this with the manufacturing scenario uh, that you presented. And there we can really see the gains in terms of economic growth, uh, poverty reduction, employment, uh, and, 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 inequality, and reduction in inequality as well. Uh, I think it's also very important to highlight in addition that uh, manufacturing, specifically manufacturing has a huge capacity for innovation and it also has uh, strong spillover effects and linkages with all other sectors. So really, uh, manufacturing could be really the engine that takes the whole economy uh, into, into a better situation and that can help in, in achieving uh, sustainable development. Uh, I mean, uh, in terms of uh, the SDGs, uh, as you know, the manufacturing is a goal in itself. It's a part of SDG 9. But it's also uh, recognized as uh, one of the main strategies or determinants for achieving all the other goals, given it's, uh, it's important in all areas of, of, of sustainable development. Um, however, uh, uh, not all manufacturing is equal. Uh, you, 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 the, the report mentions very clearly that uh, um, the, um, that this, uh, shifting from agriculture to more of low value added uh, activities will not help the continent in, in achieving the, uh, the development goals. 
Uh, what is needed is, is to move into more uh, higher productivity uh, sectors or those based on, on technologies, on, on driven by innovation. Um, but then wh when I saw the, uh, and this is maybe a, a feature of the model that you use, then when, when I see the results, uh, they are group uh, uh, according to six sectors and manufacturing is still presented as a, as a one sector. So if possible, it will also be very interesting to see uh, what's the distribution inside that manufacturing, if it's expected to go more towards uh, low value added activities or more high tech uh, activities, because I think that's what really, uh, it's, it's, it, that's really the objective, right? So I think it, it, it would be great if, if more, uh, this can be highlighted a bit more in, in, in the discussion. Um, my second point is about the, um, the I mean, the, this is not really a comment, it's just uh, also highlighting uh, the, uh, the, what has been achieved so far. Uh, we at uh, UNIDO, we are custodian of six, of the six, six uh, industry related indicators on the SDG. Uh, so we're the ones that collect the data at the national level and then build the, the global indicators and, and disseminate it. Uh, so we're, we're following very close what's happening uh, in these indicators. Um, we are actually going to be releasing a new report, the 2023 SDG 9 progress report at the beginning of September, so just in a couple of weeks. And there we show uh, in the same way that you show that uh, Africa's uh, progress has been limited. There's a lot of heterogeneity across regions, across countries, but as a, a, on the whole, it's, it's not been uh, fast enough. I mean, there has been some progress, particularly in some areas, but not fast enough to reach any of the, of the goals. We also, as part of an exercise, we did um, uh, some uh, scenarios as well for 2030, the end of the SDGs. Uh, and we we identify that none of the uh, of the goals are on track to be achieved uh, at the current uh, pace. Um, so I think as as you as you highlighted uh, very clearly in your presentation, business as usual uh, has not delivered uh, sufficient progress. And if we really want to to move ahead in, in structural transformation and in, in sustainable industrialization. Really, uh, it's very, very important to accelerate progress. And this brings me to my third topic, which is uh, the, the importance of industrial policies. Um, so industrialization will not happen by itself, right? Uh, I think it's a quite the opposite. If we leave the current kind of globalization trends and, and, and market forces to continue, uh, Africa will continue to, to, to be specialized in, in resource-based activities, in low-value added activities that will not help to achieve sustained growth. So I think it's, it's very important to, to, to implement proactive policies. Um, I think industrial policy was, there was some sort of disillusionment against uh, industrial policies over the last weekend, but after COVID and after the recent crisis, I think these are very much back on the, on the agenda. We can see all countries now, uh, big blocks uh, implementing uh, huge uh, packages of industrial policy. So I think this is very much now uh, back. And I think it's also very important for, for Africa to, to prioritize uh, the, the implementation of, of uh, industrial policies. Um, this will need to identify and target opportunities uh, that have the potential to drive this uh, economic transformation that is needed. And here there are so many tools available, uh, investment promotion, sector specific support, uh, industrial parks, uh, technology transfer mechanisms, many others, but also we cannot forget that this, it cannot happen in a vacuum. We also need to, to design all these uh, supporting policies around them, which uh, you mentioned some of them. This includes infrastructure, IT, uh, I, uh, including IT infrastructure, financing, skill development, uh, of course, uh, trade integration, uh, very, very important. Uh, I think for, fortunately, we're not starting from, from zero. There's a lot already been done. Uh, at the continental level, there's these uh, action plans uh, from the African Union on, for industrial development. There's also regional efforts from SADC, from the other regional uh, bodies. 
Uh, and also at the national policies, I guess most countries have some sort of uh, industrial policy strategies in place. But as you mentioned, the problem is not really drafting the plan and having a, a, some sort of a, a, a document uh, uh, there, but also it's, it's about implementing it. So I think this is really uh, something that I, I wanted to highlight and that you, you also mentioned. I think it will also be important to, uh, when, when possible, to try to go into more detail in the, in the policy recommendations into what sort of policies could work or could not work. Um, uh, and you know, to, to, to delve a bit more in, into, into detail and, and not just present them as industrial policies, because this is really a, a, a huge area that can cover basically a, a lot of different uh, strategies and tools. So I think it will be also important to, to highlight a bit more. Uh, for, uh, I also want to highlight the, that, I mean, that we need to be aware of increasing inequality. Uh, almost by definition, I think industrial policies will create winners and losers. Uh, and although, I mean, it's expected that in the long term, this will increase the, the welfare for the, at, at the global level, let's about the macro level. Uh, I think that short, in the short term, the, this could affect specific sectors, specific population groups. Uh, so it's also very important to, to consider the policies to support these, these groups, the, the, the affected groups during the, the transition. Uh, I think this you highlighted well in the report when you mentioned uh, you included one of your interventions or, 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 or scenarios included a, a, an increased uh, government to household transfers. Uh, so I think this is very, very important. But uh, I think much more can be said in terms of inequality. Uh, so, for example, we'd like to know what sectors will gain, what sectors will, will, will be losing. And how will this affect the workers? And it will it affect all workers, or it will be more mostly affecting low-skilled workers or workers that are specialized in very specific uh, skills that are not needed anymore? Uh, will it be the same impact for men and women as we saw in, in during COVID? The, the difference can be huge uh, on on how a shock or a policy affects men and women. So I think it's very important to consider: Will there be more opportunities for youth? And if yes, uh, how and, and how can they be fostered? Um, I think it's also very important to use these models uh, as kind of early warning systems for, for inequality uh, that can allow us to quickly see uh, or, or highlight uh, that it, it potentially inequalities will increase so that uh, policymakers are aware and, and can start uh, designing the, uh, the best response for that. Just for example, when you saw this uh, manufacturing scenario, uh, when you show it in terms of the, the impacts on, uh, on the economy or, or poverty, we saw that um, two countries that start from fairly similar uh, starting points uh, end up at very different points, you know, right? Uh, some of them gain a lot from the, from in this scenario where some of them do not. So it will be important to know why this is happening uh, if this just a feature of the model, or if this is based on some some of the on 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 or on a trend that is really expected, so we can uh, then of course uh, uh, respond to it. And then finally, my my last point is that I think at this stage there should not be any discussion on industrial development that doesn't consider environmental sustainability. Uh, Policies that only focus on, on economic growth uh, will fail sooner or later, uh, weighted down by the, the impacts on the, on the environment. Uh, we know that the industrial activity, activity can be very damaging for the environment, uh, but also it could be part of the solution by you know, creating the goods, the materials that will help in the energy transition on, 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 on increasing efficiency, uh, so that the, there is a huge interest now in green industry, and I think this is something that uh, also needs to be highlighted in the report. That there's also not, as I mentioned before, not all manufacturing is equal, so it will be very important to also consider this point. So I think this is this is it. I mean, uh, this is these are my comments. Um, I'm a statistician, but but I on purpose I didn't mention anything on the on the models and the forecasting. Uh, this we can discuss separately. But congratulations on the great work and thanks again for the invitation.
Wonderful, fantastic. Thank you so much, uh, Fernanda, for really giving us really, I would say, detailed and really specific insights um, on the various areas that were presented this morning and others that are found um, in the report and also pointing out other areas, of course, that might require further reflection, um, you know, as the team considers and continues this work. And Kwasi, perhaps before we start the q and I'll give you about a minute or two, just maybe begin to just to reflect on some of the comments that are coming out um, from our discussion. So thank you very much once again, Fernando. Um, ladies and gentlemen, we will now move on to our second uh, respondent, that is Edward Brown. And Edward Brown is a Senior Director, uh, Research and Policy Engagement at ASSET, which is the African Center for Economic Transformation. Edward has over 35 years of experience in international development, as well as public policy half of which were spent at the World Bank. He has worked extensively in Africa, Eastern Europe, as well as Central Asia. And currently, Edward manages a team of asset in-house senior policy advisors, researchers, and economists drawing on a worldwide pool of ex expertise to assist African policymakers to respond to specific challenges, as well as opportunities. Uh, furthermore, he holds a PhD and an MA in Development Economics and Demography from the University of Pennsylvania. Edward, welcome once again. Let me hand over the virtual floor for your reflections. Thank you so much, uh, Nico. Nico. Is it Nico, right? <laughs> yeah, sorry. Yeah, I, thanks for inviting me. <clears throat> and it's a pleasure to be with, with, with all of you this morning. I, I, I think um, just following on Fernando's um, observations, I just wanted to say that this has been a very well-researched topic. It's a very topical topic in itself. And to congratulate uh, IFS uh, for the work well done. Uh, I, I think you've touched on many of the, or at least most of the key issues and drivers of industrial policy and manufacturing in Africa. And I would like to just commend you for having done a very good work. And particularly the, the model, the scenarios that you set also reinforces the growing, um, I mean, the growing concern that um, African countries are de-industrializing, but there's a need for industrialization and manufacturing. And I think uh, at, at the moment, there's clearly a convergence as opposed to in the past, which was talking about just the de-industrialization and the shift to low service um, sectors. At the moment, I think there is incontrovertible evidence to suggest that if countries were deliberate, they were intentional in, in addressing their industrial policies and targeting the right levers of demand creation, uh, African countries can begin to, to industrialize and manufacturing can be a key driver. If, I mean, and you've talked about the spillover effects. There's no doubt about that. There's a spillover effect in manufacturing. But what we're seeing from the analytical work that we're doing is that when you're talking about structural transformation, two elements come to mind. One is within sector productivity. And the second is across sector productivity. And in fact, the evidence suggests today, and, and we'll be releasing the report, which is the African Transformation Index in the next couple of months. So I suggest that for most African countries, what seems to have happened, even with low productivity, is that within sector productivity is driving growth. And uh, between sectors is very marginal. And, and this is reflective of the fact that manufacturing is not growing, as you rightly said. I think that issue is there. So the need to really uh, drive manufacturing in order to create the structural transformation that we're talking about is very important. Um, the one point I wanted to make, uh, I, I, I like very much the 10-point recommendation that has been I mean, in, in the report. And I would just like to dwell a bit on a few of them. But first, as everyone is saying, um, manufacturing and industrial, industrialization is not going to happen on its own. The, the market forces are going to, <clears throat> there are so much market failures that the role of the state is critical. And I like the idea of the activist government, which you're mentioning. You know, it has to be intentional. The state has to be entrepreneurial. And I wanted to uh, just look at two or three areas with, which you highlighted and to sort of, uh, I mean, deep dive a little bit into it. I think one is the issue of the macro fiscal framework. Yes, you need a stable macro fiscal environment, 
But we all know that this is a very, very tall order. And countries to, today are at a stage, in fact, in their economic uh, uh, transformation where the macro conditions are extremely distortionary. Uh, currently, governments are very hard to strap for debt increases and so on. But that does not prevent governments from still focusing on industrial policy. And in as much as most countries are going for the IMF um, relief, there's also the need to begin to look much more strategically at how you really create the demand, I mean, the supply response for industrial industrialization in the countries. And I think from that perspective, heterodox macro policies are going to be important. In other words, even in the ecosystem of macro fiscal distortions, you could still target certain fiscal tools to ensure that you can continue to leverage private sector development in ways that would make the industry much more competitive and, and, and sustainable. And from that perspective, I think um, a lot of countries here, we're talking about the role of develop, national development banks or the DFIs. There are DFIs of the North, but also the DFIs in the, in the South. And some studies have been undertaken where most of these DFIs are just a shadow of the real, uh, I mean, policy directions. So there's a need to look at that because DFIs can help to de-risk financing in ways that would allow small and medium-sized enterprises to become much more investment ready. Uh, the other dimension I wanted to talk about is um, the whole issue of uh, technological transfer. When, when you look at the transformation trajectory of African economies, technological input, as uh, Kwasi mentioned, was very minimal. It requires a deliberate support. And part of the uh, scenario or the good practices that were done by the Asian Tigers was the government playing a role in attracting joint venture, joint ventureships, JVs. FDI is important, but they're also footloose. But JVs offer tremendous opportunities for small and medium-sized enterprises in Africa to learn and to adapt and to have market access. And those policies must be strategic in ways that would ensure that the JVs transfer knowledge to the local uh, uh, enterprises in the country. And here again is the deliberate activist policies of government that is very important in order to achieve that. Uh, the other point on the manufacturing issue is that we all recognize that the Asian approach or the uh, the methodology that the Asian countries applied to industrialize may not be uh, you know, appropriate at this time for African economies. They were, ma manufacturing was labor intensive in Asia. It, it pulled out huge numbers of people out of poverty. You know, in China, more than a third of the population was moved out of poverty and, and the same thing in Korea and so on. But what we're seeing in manufacturing in the advent of the fourth industrial revolution and the need to be competitive globally is that even as African countries continue to push and drive for manufacturing as one of the key drivers because of the spillover effects, we have to recognize that the employment creation potential may not be anywhere near what the Asian countries achieved. And therefore, there is the need to begin to look at what kind of manufacturing should African countries or industrial policies should they pursue? They should be pursuing industrial policies that are equally looking at how job creation can be enhanced, where there's job destruction from digitalization and other things, um, job creation can be enhanced. And this also implies that you need to look at the sectors that are more likely in the short to medium term to offer possi I mean, possibilities to create job. We know that today Africa has one of the largest uh, workforce, but most of the workforce is poorly skilled. They are not skilled in the areas where the demand is being created. So industrial policies must be deliberate in this respect. And I just wanted to make that point 
I, I, I don't think that was adequately emphasized in the report because the whole issue of employment, when we're talking about manufacturing as a driver of structural transformation, yes, but structural transformation means what? It means increasing livelihoods. It means inclusiveness, increase improving well, well-beings of the population. And that means creating jobs for people. So that particular element of it is still the big elephant in the room. And how we address that is going to be very important. And I think part of the solution also lies in what the African Union has been pushing, that, that is the AFCFTA, the whole issue of regional collaboration and integration, which would allow regional value change to be created. And therefore labor can move to where the demand is greatest given the nature of the, of, the, of the economies, there are varieties of uh, opportunities across the continent in many, many areas where resource endowments are, are different and where the opportunities to really create partnerships and grow the regional value chains is going to be very, very important. So I think that is one of the critical things we need to look at and that even on the in national industrial policies must also have a regional perspective, because many of these firms we're talking about are going to be small to the extent that they cannot compete in, in the I mean, regional markets. And we know even now that the little intra-Africa trade that is occurring, almost half of it is in processed or high value added or value added product, products as opposed to only just, just, just about 14% of the product, I mean, production, African exports, continental, inter, intercontinental exports, only 14% are processed or value added products. Most of them are commodities, primary products and so on. So there is an inherent benefit in really trying to push into African trade because it's going to ensure and force countries to, to continue to increase value addition in their economy, to diversify their products, to be resilient. And one of the things that we're observing uh, in, the, in the report that is coming out soon is that African economies are not diversifying to the extent that they are, you know, um, they are prone to uh, basically shocks, external shocks that comes and they are not able to be resilient enough to cushion these shocks and to be able to recover quickly. So there are issues relating to diversification, which is important in industrial policy. The export competitiveness is not just because you want to export, but you want to pitch yourself against the best so that you are com competitive and you are sustainable. But even more important is how governments can support improvements in productivity and technological upgrading. If governments begin to focus on these dimensions of industrial policies, and particularly looking at how the economies can be better integrated into the regional and continental markets, we stand a very good chance of achieving the objective of manufacturing being a driver of structural transformation in Africa. So I'll stop here for the moment and um, maybe we can add a question and answer period are they available to, to, I mean, to contribute? All right, absolutely. Thank you so much, um, Edward, for your valuable insights and really focusing really, I suppose, on the recommendations element, you know, of the report to say what needs to happen for us to get manufacturing to a place where it really makes a positive impact um, as, as we strive for greater industrialization on the continent. And I think you cannot have overemphasized really the role of the state, um, the role of actual effective policies, but I suppose even relevant policies that will work for our in our context um, in Africa and really beginning to identify those key sectors that hold the most potential um, for industrialization on the continent. So thank you very much, um, Edward, for that. And I think you also touched on another element on the AFCFTA, an absolute critical tool as well um, to really further advance industrialization. Thank you very much for that. And I think we'll come back in the Q&A section um, to address some of the comments that are coming up uh, from, from our participants online. 
Um, allow us now, uh, colleagues, to head over to our third respondent, third respondent, uh, Blaise Bayou. He is a tech and public policy researcher at Asset uh, with a background spanning development planning, software development, entrepreneurship, and digital innovations, as well as ecosystem development. Uh, Blaise was a research assistant at the Department of Economic History at Lund University in Sweden, and he holds a master's in innovation and sustainable development from Lund University in Sweden as well. Blaise, allow me to welcome you to the virtual floor uh, to join your colleagues and give us your insights into the presentation that we have received this morning. Over to you, Blaise. Thank you, um, Nico. I think my colleagues have actually discussed some of the key issues. So, um, but I'll say this is a great report. It touched on some of the key challenges facing um, Africans in terms of building an industrial base. Um, issues of infrastructure bottlenecks that you know span across at the country level, but also across regions. Um, also, you look at um, you know sometimes I would say it is cheaper to fly to London and it's faster than to reach Sierra Leone, which is just like a few kilometers away from Ghana. These are some of the challenges that we face in terms of regional integration um, and also for the manufacturing sector because goods have to move, talents have to move. And the previous um, speakers have touched on the importance of labor mobility and also um, intra-African trade. But also what is the domestic cap capacity in terms of um, you know, sustaining the manufacturing sector? When you have an exit of foreign um, firms, usually the domestic sector collapses because there's lack of um, local capacity to sustain this uh, growth that has been achieved. And also siloed production pipe pipelines, big value chains are some of the things that um, I outlined and the previous speakers have touched on that. But just to say there's zero input output relationships across Africa. So um, firms or manufacturing firms are usually scattered all over with zero knowledge about, you know, what are the outputs of other firms that they can use as inputs for their production. And so um, information gaps also continue to hinder the, the networking of manufacturing firms and the ability to build that synergy, input output relationships and make sure that there's a, a very coherent and competitive ecosystem, but also very based on knowledge sharing and labor mobility. I think regional trade, previous speakers, I think, have spoken about it. But I would want to say that if you look at Africa, um, African consumers typically have a low purchasing power, um, an average of about $5 a day compared to $6 a day in India. Even though these two purchasing power are almost like the same. However, India has a very high um, you know, manufacturing activity because firms are able to access a harmonized market of about one, one $1.4 billion. Whereas African manufacturing firms have to face like smaller and fragmented markets in their countries. And so the cross-border mobility, again, um, is something that needs to be addressed. And I think the report also touched on that. So, you know, going hard on uh, Africa and making sure that we implement the, um, the recommendations and government should implement it is very important. African manufacturing firms need to scale across borders and face different regulatory um, requirements. And that, you know, also inhibits industrial um, development policy. I'll then go into um, looking at a new dimension, which is that we need better data and capacity building of firms across Africa. So investment, uh, manufacturing depends a lot on investment, which sometimes has to do with capital from outside the continent. And so for investors to invest and uh, support local manufacturing firms, they need to better understand the data on opportunities, firm progress, and also what, you know, are the challenges that you know are likely to come so that they can model and simulate their investment decisions and also what is the capacity of local firms to be able to produce and innovate and so once investors don't have these decisions also then they cannot support and partner local firms to grow and and you know um, expand production across borders so limited data on opportunities modeling of development and of bankable projects remains a challenge so entrepreneurs usually burn out due to low capital supply or inability to access capital, which is like very um, um, risky, but also like expensive within the continent. So having the injection of patient capital from across the borders is important. But as I said, for green industrialization, better data is needed and also the capacity of, lo of local firms to manage these funds sustainably is also important. So for green industrialization, which is becoming the critical thing for Africa, we need data to support this process. So the future of Africa um, manufacturing has to be African-led. 
and you know policies are needed governments to create a business and invest investment environment that will accelerate the, the investment and then also building the robust credit lines is important and so having the private sector to play a significant role we also need to build their capacity on project design and implementation so um the manufacturing sector a lot is highly is highly technical and technology driven and so without a capacity usually then you can have um, even governments manage projects halfway and cannot complete it we've seen situations in africa where huge huge sums of money have been invested into projects um, and then they don't come into fruition either they go halfway and there's the limited capacity to expand this or there wasn't enough data to understand the source of raw materials for these um, firms and then you know the projects are abandoned leading to waste of money so in the future we are looking at the need for us to leverage on our capacity and building um, the need for specialized knowledge zones up to accompany Africa's industrialization so we need local and contextual knowledge that is um, able to drive the growth and empower us to innovate and understand what the linkages are. So research and development from our um, universities is important. We need to activate the third arm of Africa's uh, um, um, research institutions into R&D to support our manufacturing drive. Um, industry and university relationships are very important and also firm to firm knowledge sharing, which is something that is very key. And if you look at other areas, it's usually based on local networks of firms that support the manufacturing drive um, within those countries. So we need that um, if we are to build a very robust manufacturing system. Second, uh, yeah, I've also listened to previous speakers about the potential um, of job creation and the report this, they touch on the fact that, you know, we may not have the same job creation as it happened in Asian African countries in terms of Africa. So I see the trend that we are moving towards digital manufacturing but it could create jobs in other ways because we'll still need the skills of designers. You would need the youth to be um, do digital printing, to go into areas like data modeling, and that could still create jobs for the manufacturing sector. So I think that um, the fear of um, um, zero job or little job creation can actually be tackled through leveraging the skills of other um, um, sectors to come into the manufacturing sector and support them and make them produce faster more economical so that they can sell cheaper within the continent. So the question I've asked is, and I was going to ask is that, will technology actually burst Africa's bubble in terms of um, becoming the future source of labor force? Um, we're looking at automation, robotics, and AI. I think, no, uh, we need to just train the other skills that accompany um, the new form of manufacturing that is technology-led, like digital manufacturing, which I mentioned. Different skills are needed. People who are not really um, engineers but can support in the process, to design, to um, provide other forms of support is important. Even digital marketing are skills that manufacturing firms need to be able to sell their produce and gain access to different markets. So even just look at if you're a firm in Ghana, um, surrounded by Franco Francophone countries, um, a, French, a, a French expert, you know, trained in Ghana could also be a source of employment to support the manufacturing firms in the design of their product labels, in um, their marketing promotions to the Francophone market. So I see that it's going to be complementary and actually drive growth in other areas in terms of jobs. Um, I'll conclude by saying, what next? Um, I've seen the, I think the report touched on the textile sector as a low um, you know, area, but I think there's the potential. Africa imports a lot in terms of clothing and textiles. And I think if we can also build our competencies in that area, um, in terms of a sector that you know we can harness, build our potential, and produce enough of the textiles that could also help and also export to other countries. I see a potential to drive a lot of growth um, within the manufacturing sector um, to support other areas. I'll say um, it was a great report, touch on various key areas, and just wanted to add the aspect of data, um, looking at knowledge flows and networks and how that can support innovation growth. Inno uh, sorry, that can support manufacturing and industrial policy within the continent. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Blaise, for your for your comments and your insights, really complementing uh, what our previous speakers have said, but also introducing that new element of saying, how do we focus, you know, on, on data and how do we use data to grow our manufacturing industries and really to leapfrog towards um, industrialization um, and also the element on, you know, the private sector, how, you know, what, what sort of um, uh, 
um, you know, plans are there to capacitate them um, as well and really make them an active player as well as we strive towards industrialization. Also mentioned elements of knowledge sharing as well amongst and between. So I think these are all elements that are absolutely, absolutely critical um, as we talk industrialization. And of course, I know I said I would give you about maybe a minute just to reflect uh, on some of the comments that have been coming out from our discussants. And I really mean a minute, absolutely. And then we can go into our Q&A. So Kosi, over to you for your initial uh, reflections. Thank you, Nico. And I think, uh, thank you. I thank the respondent for very, very insightful comments. On, on manufacturing in Africa. And I agree with uh, uh, their comments and they complement each other, especially that uh, manufacturing will not come or industrialization will not come on its own. And we need to work hard. It's a long-term and difficult process and that African countries need to work hard if we want to industrialize. So we can move to the Q&A where we can discuss further. Thank you very much. Um, I'm just going to scroll down and just try and um, get some questions that we'll pose um, that you're free to answer. Uh, Kwasi, Fernando, Edward, and Blaze, uh, please feel free to jump in if you feel that this is a question um, that you would like to address. There's a question here which is rather quite long and technical, but I'll try my best just to summarize it. Um, and this question is um, directed um, to yourself, Kwasi. Um, this comes from a Frank Vector. Uh, who really wants to get a better understanding of the GDP numbers that you presented. There was an element where you spoke um, about an increase from 8.5 trillion USD to 9.1. If perhaps you can just speak us through what those figures actually mean, is it just specific to manufacturing or GDP um, as a whole? So perhaps if you can just reflect on, you know, the crafting of those numbers and what those figures actually mean. Okay, thank you, Nico. The GDP is uh, the overall of the size of African economy. So when the manufacturing scenario, we sh show the impact of that scenario on overall uh, economy, not only in the manufacturing sector, it's uh, the, the whole economy. So we have to see how manufacturing will drive economic growth in Africa. So it's the GDP of the whole uh, Africa economy, but we can also have GDP per country. And yes, but it's not only in the manufacturing sector. But the whole sector all right, combined. So it's overall. Yeah, yeah. All right. All right. Great. Thanks. Thank you very much um, for that clarification. Uh, I have here a comment and a question that comes from Abigail Past. It congratulates you, Kwasi, on a great presentation. And uh, she says, I agree with Ed and Blaze. And she has two questions. She says, What do we need to pivot to focus on green in industrialization and will green industrialization offer us job creation um so that's the first question the second question would be how can think tanks and CSOs support governments to be intentional with weak institutions and lack of transparency so i'm going to pause it there's so the one on the element on green industrialization but also how you know think tanks and CSOs can support governments um in the area of well, you know weak institutions and transparency elements. So I leave this question to yourself, Kwasi, and of course, all our other respondents as well are welcome to, to join in. Thank you, Nico. Yeah, green industri industrialization, as I mentioned in, in my presentation, Africa possesses critical minerals that will be used, that we required for green transition. For example, electric vehicles and green technologies. So if Africa can leverage those resources to advance uh, manufacturing in Africa and that can create a job. In fact, Africa can be a new destination for global supply chains. Uh, if we take the necessary policy to bring uh, investors in Africa, not to export those minerals. As I said, many countries have already started, I committed to advance their industry, industrialization using uh, these uh, critical minerals because of, uh, in, during this uh, green transition. Ghana, Namibia, Zimbabwe, and other countries, they have banned export. So, so that to attract investors in Africa to come and process this mineral here in Africa. So I think it can create a lot of jobs. Right. Thank you very much. And perhaps let me also maybe ask uh, perhaps Fernando or Edward Blaze if you want to weigh in on that second element that spoke about, you know, the work, you know, think tanks and, you know, SEOs as well as Edward and I see uh, Ed, your camera's on, so mm -hmm. I believe you would like to make a few comments or respond. Yeah, there. yeah. just to add to what um, Kwasi said, I think to hone down more concretely, 
this is where the, the state or the government must be entrepreneurial. It must be able to analyze what are the potential growth areas in green economy. Uh, the examples are there all over the world. Um, the government must create, must incentivize supply response in those areas. Say, for example, if you're talking about, you know, you're talking about battery production or you're talking about photovoltaic, and even in agriculture, a number of other derivatives can be much more smart agriculture. And what does that mean? needs to be done. And this is where the interface or the collaboration between the think tanks, the CSOs, and the government, you know, in, in academic institutions in a triple hilux framework ecosystem to begin to address some of these issues concretely. You have to be concrete and specific. And we have to identify the areas that have potential growth areas, given our endowments and given the regional ecosystem. What does it look like? So for example, um, you're talking about in Ghana, we have bauxite, we have aluminum in Guinea, large deposits of it and all that. And there isn't anywhere in any of our industrial policies, if they exist at all, that we are looking at some of the dynamics. How can we leverage our, our resource advantages to begin to build a much sustainable you know, industry within that space, which is green? You know, and every country is doing its own and it doesn't work. So I think critically, there is a role for the state. The government should be more strategic and nimble. It must be open to engaging and collaborating with uh, think tanks, private sector, universities, and so on. Because this is an area where learning, you know, you're learning, a lot of learning is required. Exposure to what has happened elsewhere is going to be very important in order to ensure that uh, we are strategic enough and then we are aligning our fiscal policies. Fiscal policies are critical. Fiscal policies to the industrial policies. At the moment, most countries under the current IMF programs are being forced to focus on domestic resource mobilization. That is important to be able to become a lot more independent, but also you may be killing the goose that lays the golden egg. And if you look at some of the taxes and levies that governments all over are exacting on the private sector, it's going to be a very daunting challenge if the fiscal framework is not aligned with an industrial policy that would provide support and respite for the small and medium-sized enterprises to become competitive and to move into the green sector economy. Even waste, we're talking about plastics. There's a lot of things that can be done out of it. Even if you cannot control the production of plastics, how do you recycle? Think about the circular economy. What does it mean? What are some of the opportunities that exist to even create jobs in those areas? Fundamentally, these are areas that government needs to look at. I just stop here. Wonderful. No, thank you so much for those um, insights. I see Fernando, your, your, your camera's on. I think you might, would you like to weigh in? And while you're thinking about that, there's a question that has come through that I'd also like you to address as well. Um, this question has come through um, from Fasel Berega. And here he talks about, you know, the industrial parks um, that, that, that have been developed. I just to know whether or not... ...any examples... Uh, or any lessons that we can learn from countries that have already invested millions in anticipated uh, or as hoped. Um, over to you, Fernando. Yes, uh, thank you. So I, I just wanted to complement what Ed uh, had already said uh, about the green industry. So this really, it, it's it's a new model. It's, it's a new uh, type of thinking of how to approach uh, uh, production uh, and employment in, in the sector. Uh, it involves things of uh, things like uh, uh, green sources of energy, uh, a circular economy model, uh, efficient use of materials or new materials that are more, um, uh, you know, that require less materials or that require less uh, use of energy. Uh, and this is really based on on innovation, on on knowledge, on new technologies, on advanced production processes. So it's it's. Um, while it has huge potentials, it's also, uh, let's say, it, it, it has a lot of requirements into uh, what is needed, but it could be also a huge uh, source of, of new jobs, of new economic opportunities that uh, I think should be uh, prioritized. 
Uh, this will require, of course, uh, building the required skills uh, uh, and, and, and the required um, conditions uh, to foster the kind of enterprise. And as I mentioned, it requires active policy, it requires an active uh, government that implements consciously uh, policies to implement, uh, to, to foster the, the green economy. So these are uh, just a, an additional comment I want to bring in this area. Thank you. Right. Thank you so much, uh, Fernando. And perhaps, uh, you know, another question that I think any of the other, um, you know, colleagues are, are welcome to take up is the issue of industrial parks. You know, to what extent really are industrial parks actually attaining the objective for which they've been set out? Um, are the results that we are seeing actually, uh, you know, parallel to what we are expecting um, of them to contribute to industrialization? Yeah. Does anybody want can, to can weigh I, in? Yeah, I can just quickly yes, go ahead, Ed, go um, ahead. Offer, offer some. Yes, I mean, industrial parks um, in, the, in the last couple of decades um, have, in Africa, it's been fluctuating wh whether they are really driving industrialization and export competitiveness and all that. And um, so the jury is still out on it. But notwithstanding, there are good examples that we can we can find in Mauritius, you can, uh, in, um, in Ethiopia, you know, they've done a fairly good job in, in the textile sector and the leather industry and so on. But one of the points that um, I think a gentleman raised about um, learning and cross support is that industrial parks, if well-defined, can provide, particularly if you look at in Korea, for example, there were clusters specializing in certain products so that there's a learning going on within that space in, in those packs. So for example, in, in, in uh, Ethiopia, you had the textile and the garment industries all co-located in one industrial pack. So there is current, I mean, a process of feedback loop, learning and getting things to, to increase productivity and so on. So industrial packs offer tremendous opportunities for growth and export competitiveness. And I think if government policies are well aligned, particularly on the area of sustainability, looking at some of the risks of, I mean, that can occur because of pollution and so on. If industrial packs can be designed in ways that become more green, even using the, the, the waste in, in, the, in the parks as a source of energy and so on. And there are examples of that, but it requires a policy, clear policies and regulations that, that would allow that to occur. So there's no doubt in my view that industrial parks offer tremendous opportunities, but it must be better managed. In some cases, you know, assigning it to the private sector that has a commercial and financial you know, uh, I mean, requirements that are robust and, and therefore can work better as opposed to governments building their own industrial parks and the whole issues of governance that surrounds it, who gets there, uh, how much tax do you collect and so on becomes a little bit more messy. So I, I, I think there's a middle road here where the private sector can play a good role, where government works with private sector to design this and policies that are you know, focused on how do you increase competitiveness, how do you improve technological upgrading and also productivity in those parks? I stop you. Thank you very much for those. Uh, yeah, thank you very much for those insights, um, Ed. And you know, some of the questions that are coming up, some of them are comments, um, some of them are questions, which I think some of our respondents actually spoke to even before we go, you know, we, we entered into the session. But there's one that I would like to raise. This is a question that comes from um Dennis. Uh, and Dennis asks, how do you see uh the auto? automation trend in manufacturing sector um, really as it leads to fewer labor force requirements. So what would that relationship be between you know, automation, manufacturing, job creation, as well as industrialization? Uh, Kwasi, would you like to weigh in on that or perhaps any um, of our other respondents? Yeah, because uh, yeah, as a, as a technology, now manufacturing is driven by a technology, a technology automation, and also other firms also in Africa, manufacturing also in Africa are importing this technology uh, uh, from elsewhere. So uh, automation is increasing in manufacturing sector and that's why we are talking about job issues. So we should design the industry policy in such a way that we create a strong connection with other sectors because manufacturing cannot create a lot of jobs like what we saw in, in Asia. For example, in 2014, manufacturing created more than 50 million jobs in in China 
and this is not going to happen in Africa like that because we are importing technology and others firms also are investing in labor serving technology, which we are importing. So autom automation is, is taking the lead, which also will uh, affect the ability of the manufacturing sector in Africa to create a job. But we should focus on the linkage, as I say, and the, the job will come indirectly, not directly. Yes. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, yes, please go ahead. Go ahead, uh, Ed. I, I, I just wanted to offer an additional point on that. I agree totally that manufacturing is not going to, uh, I mean, create the jobs. Uh, and But again, the question is, what sectors are more amenable to job creation? What, what is the elasticity of demand for jobs? in that in, in in sectors and there are certain sectors particularly the light manufacturing i in your report you were seem you seem to um underestimate the importance of light manufacturing and the whole issue of heavy industry and so on like korea and others but i think in africa first of all our endowments our natural endowments in agriculture agro processing while it's beginning to become a little bit more capital intensive it still employs tremendous amount of people even in the processing sector and also, also, it will have a spillover effect to, to increasing, uh, I mean, agricultural outputs and productivity. So in those areas, and even within the ag agro process sector, the whole area of logistics, which of transportation and all that, if government infrastructure are well defined to reduce the cost you know, to, to the firms, and port logistics are, are more efficient, these things are what the, the state should do, because they need to focus on those areas where the private sector in and itself would not venture into because of the cost and the public good element of it, which is what the government's supposed to be doing. So you talked about electricity, that's, that, that, that's important. But the roads, the rails, and so on are going to be very, very important. And these can help to create the jobs that are labor intensive, you know, in the short term. Of course, there's a window, you know, and the point is, if you want to be competitive globally, then, the the your model of 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 manufacturing may have to align a little bit more with the technological upgrading which are labor destruction they 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 are destroying labor but at the same time you want to be competitive in that place and that is why i think the regional intra africa trade offers tremendous opportunity for african countries over the next two decades where they can increase their productivity in in light manufacturing the processing value add and so on, which would create jobs and opportunities for uh, the population, which is still growing. As Jack Celius uh, uh, says, the demographic dividend is not yet there. Africa is still very much at a plateau when it comes to the transition. And we're still having a growing workforce, which is ill-equipped. The education system is not aligned to the growing nature of jobs. And this is where the role of the state becomes even more important to see at the extent to which the labor market responses or the demands are being addressed through the supply side in terms of education, training, and skills development. Just stop here. Thank you very much, uh, Ed, and I think you've preempted. Uh, I was going to invite um, our respondents just to give us about 30 um, seconds in terms of their closing remarks as we draw the seminar to a close. Um, so Ed will take those as your closing reflections. Thank you very much for that. Let me inv invite uh, Blaise and then we'll invite Fernando just to give us your short reflections, 30 seconds, and we head to a close. Yeah, thank you. I would say, um, you know, industrialization in Africa must be Africa-led, um, driven by indigenous knowledge um, investment comp and then complemented by cre credit from the global space. Um, I believe we should also pivot towards green industrialization that you know offers a great opportunity. We have the raw materials from um, solar energy to hydrogen um, and to renewable energy uh, recycling, circular economy, as Ed mentioned. So I think the opportunity is great. We should also find ways to link that to job creation. I don't think um, the, the move towards technology adoption would reduce jobs, but through policy, we can rather enhance job creation and bring along the youth to have the requisite skills to complement um, local firms in this industrialization drive. I would also emphasize again, knowledge flows in terms of building the linkages, um, special parks, knowledge parks, and bringing on board our universities. Um, but also addressing some of the challenges you said. 
AFTCA presents the opportunity, let's go for the um, trade, intra-regional trade, reduce most of the barriers and connect Africa through, um, if it is highway transportation or making air travel cheaper, finding alternative ways to get goods and labor moving across. Um, I think that would be a great way to build in demand for the products within the continent and remove the fragmentations within um, the economies that limit the ability of, of firms to have demand for their products. All right, fantastic. Thank you very much. Great use of your 30 seconds. And before I call on you, Fernando, just to let our participants online know um, that we'll be launching a very short poll that will pop up onto your screens. Please just take your time just to you know provide us with responses that would really better um, aid us in as, as, as we convene further sessions. Fernando, over to you. Yes, uh, thank you. I just wanted to highlight that uh, any kind of transformation, be it a, a traditional structural transformation, be it green industrialization, automation, everything, uh, uh, it's a change uh, and it will require a transition. Um, and I think here is very important to have a few elements in place to, to make our, uh, the best out of that transition. This requires, for example, uh, uh, supporting infrastructure, adequate financing, uh, very, very important education and skills. This is really uh, where we provide flexibility for the labor force to adapt to, to the changes. And also cannot be underestimated uh, the role of the state, uh, an active policy that has a, a clear goals, uh, uh, that un understands the, th these changes, what, uh, what they are gonna bring for the for the country, what are the opportunities, and that really then seek to to maximize and utilize those opportunities. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Um, to also really uh, extend a word of thanks and, and sharing of um, the report. Um, allow me as well to thank, uh, of course, ISS uh, and the AUDA NEPET team, and to thank our discussants as well. Fernando, Edward, and Blaze, very grateful um, for your insights. We are also very grateful for support from the members of the ISS Partnership Forum, that is the Hans Seidel Foundation, the European Union, the Open Society Foundations, as well as the governments of Denmark, Ireland, the Netherlands, Norway, as well as Sweden. This has been a thoroughly engaging session. And just to thank you as well for indulging us as we took a little bit longer um, than we already you know, initially scheduled. But thank you very much. I think we had a very jam-packed uh, um, session this morning. Uh, please do join us for our next seminar title, The Impact of Leapfrogging and Large Infrastructure Builds on Africa's Development Potential. Our next seminar is scheduled for next week, Friday, the 25th of August, starting at 11.30 Central African time. Once again, thank you very much. Thoroughly enjoyed the discussion. And from myself, I will see you again soon. Wishing you all a very great afternoon ahead. Goodbye.